Hi everybody. Um, data quality is one of those topics. It's uh, it can be really boring, but I do try and make it exciting. I'm passionate about. It, I love it. So so hopefully some of that will be a bit infectious. Um, the title, as you can see, is delighting your BI users with high quality data. If you don't have high quality data, you're going to have a lot of unhappy users. And also this year, I was just asked to please tease in something about master data management. So I'll give you a quick. Uh, snapshot on how MDM can actually boost the agility and performance and capability of throughput into your BI world. But just to get some definitions out of the way, just for laughs, I looked at what delight actually means and it means enjoyment and happiness. So who wants happiness and enjoyment in their BI user community, right? <laughs> so I thought that's really good. Um, other uh, words for joy, glee, cons uh, contentment, the one I liked was ecstasy. Can you imagine that? B-I ecstasy? Yeah. Gladness and joy. Here's some, uh, some of the opposites. Discontent, dissatisfaction, sadness and sorrow. So we don't want a sad B-I environment. Depression, unhappiness and disappointment. I see disappointment in B-I a lot. And that's where accessibility and quality are not manifest in the solution. So, uh, so I'm really pleased to talk on the topic today. Uh, couple, this is uh, the advertisement of who I am. It's a, a, a shot. I was asked to supply some factoid. I like fast things. And I like motor, motorcycling, and that's my daughter and I uh, heading out on Friday, uh, going for a ride. Um, in 2008, I wrote a book on uh, data quality, and the opening gambit was this quote: "Fast is fine, but accuracy is everything." So if you're an archer. Or you're a gunslinger, or a, you know, like uh, Wyatt Earp. Some of you may have seen the movie. You know, uh, if you can't shoot straight, you're not a lot of value. And, and if you if you take that thought process into some of the topics that we've heard today, uh, and you've all obviously read and seen in this around big data, you know, if we have big data quality issues, we're going to have a whole lot of fast, inaccurate information. So we need to be able to do data well regardless of its size. Yeah. Um, this particular chart, it kind of anchors, uh, I, I use this a lot, you're welcome to use it. This is going to be uh, open source, this particular chart. It talks about a variety of industries. Inside each industry there's a way that they organise their business. Further down in the technology execution layer, there's services, IT capabilities, and human and automated processes delivered through people and technology platforms. But data and information is absolutely crucial to be pumped up into those lines of business for them to operate, understand their business, to react and be, even be proactive and such. Yeah? If that data and information effort has um, low fidelity, poor data supply, ambiguity and a whole range of things and I'll, I'll spell out these risks um, in a moment but that will cause grief in each of those departments and I will tell you categorically that you can measure the success of your BI by the reduction of shadow IT and shadow BI efforts. So if we're genuinely succeeding we should be taking some of the pain out of the user community where they're not having to be so um, it's not self-sufficient. Some of them are self-sufficient out of necessity, yeah, that the BI systems are failing. Now down the bottom here is to supply that data and information. We need to understand there's a whole ecosystem. This is a, a little bit like building a cake or making a cake. You don't build a cake, sorry. So we need some ingredients, right? And we need a method to go about putting the ingredients together. We might need some equipment as well, a stove and some heat and some, some, some implements, yeah? So let's go through our toolkit. Let's go through our data toolkit to understand how do we deliver information to an enterprise. So I'm just going to walk you from left to right because I'm going to come back and we're going to break through this and we're going to talk about quality and MDM as it relates to the delivery of high function, high fidelity BI. So down the bottom, we need data ownership. We need to understand who owns the data and who's accountable and responsible for the information. If we don't, you end up with people copying information and what happens when you copy information through an organisation? Guess what? The governance, the stewardship and the ownership never travels with that without some deliberate effort. And usually what I'm declaring today is the case, 
data just moves around ungoverned. That creates duplication, semantic issues, misunderstanding and a lot of confusion. We need to understand and define the data. What is the data that we've got? How does it relate to our business? Right now I'm working with a water utility. They have a huge um, dependency on physical assets, pumps, pipelines. There's uh, lin what they call linear assets that have all these weird data attributes. They need to know the compounds, whether they're PVC plastic or they're 70 year old ceramic items. There's a whole lot of data and information being collected about a business. Something around customer. Who are my customers? What are we selling them? Do we engineer a product? What are our products? What are our offerings? And how do they interrelate? So we need to define all our data definitions and the relationships. So we need glossaries, we need data models, we need a whole bunch of disciplines to define the information. Next we need to master data. For example, where is the source of truth for my customer information, for my location information, for my asset information, for my service and maintenance, for my different products, where is the source of truth for that? A lot of organisations not only do not have that defined very well, but they have a horrible array of duplicates that don't always match. Last year I worked for a global bank who had three customer masters causing all kinds of confusion. And what we had to do was choose a brand new system of fourth to master all this together or alternatively choose one of the three and synchronise so at least we could have a coherent view and a consistent view of customer. Next we get into, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a, in a bit more detail, mastering and master data management. Trusting information. Now I've got this fantastic visualisation platform to help me called Yellowfin and I've got these really fast underlying machines like Vectorwise and such. But if I can't trust the data that I'm looking at, guess what? As, as a partner, a reseller, OEM, you'll have difficulty in your sales process because often customers will look at the solution but the data is wrong. And then if you're over in user land, or of course the same stakeholders sitting in these lines of business, they like the visual but they don't like the output. The numbers are wrong, they don't make sense. Furthermore, we've, we're moving data. So in this block here we're moving and integrating data. So there's data at rest and there's data in flight. And we need to know what data is travelling through the pipes of the organisation. Why do we want to duplicate pipes? We don't. What are, the, what are the packages, the formats, the messages and, and, and such? Now getting out into this area, this is where applications, reporting, data warehouse and BI rest. This is where the value, it's like a volcano, erupts up into the business. Most of the business do not see this, these disciplines. This is the work that typically from a hygiene perspective and a discipline from a data architecture perspective needs to occur but it's in this block they will see Yellowfin, they will see the data, they will consume it through the applications and tools like Yellowfin to pump that information up to make decisions and operate the business. Final two, the data needs to be resting on platforms that are reliable and resilient, okay, and some of that can also change from time to time. And finally, I want to understand as an organisation how well do we do data, how mature are we, how much does all this stuff cost, which it does, and how do I optimise and how do I actually improve. I need a whole funding framework and training and a, a maturity model to, to, so I can understand how to improve my world. So that's kind of the preamble, just so you understand this is the way that when I walk into a, a large organisation how to break up the work and if there's data quality issues I start traversing all the building blocks looking for some uh, f a footing and often I won't find data models, I won't find an inventory of data, I won't find sources of truth, yeah? So I can actually see where the foundations are actually broken and then where to remediate. So where does uh, master data management and uh, um, data quality fit? These are all uh, cast in green. I've just cast these two in orange uh, here. So we've got MDM and data quality. Today's session is about that, but it's all about driving high value and fidelity and speed in this environment, okay? This chart, a bit difficult to read. I encourage you to, to get a hold of um, the chart pack so you can read through the risks if these foundational elements are not remediated. 
I'll just touch on a few of them just so you kind of get a sense. And it's by no means exhaustive, but quite some of you might relate to some of the issues that you've seen in different accounts or project situations. Uh, in addition, um, I'm spending a bit of time on master data management and I've cut out some data quality slides from last year. If you want to get a hold of last year's presentation, get a hold of the Yellowfin folks or, or grab a business card. I'll just flick you a copy of the detailed charts from last year that are much more uh, granular uh, in regards to data quality. So I'm just going to quickly step through some risks. With data ownership, uh, data ownership is not well defined. We have unclear accountabilities and responsibilities. Um, that is a recipe for confusion. Uh, definitions, we have no metadata, we have no models, we have no idea of how our data is in, in fact defined. We don't know what our keys are, how to link customers or products or assets together, that kind of thing. Um, under normal circumstances, most of you understand this, but it's not unrealistic to walk into a situation where that is indeed the case, dealing with legacy systems or new organisations that have very little um, data engineering understanding. Master data, where is the source of truth? Where is the source of truth for my customer inform information? I'm going to use customer as an example, it's kind of a universal example, we're all customers of some business, um, so it's a, it's a useful one. But if it's not mastered then data is actually duplicated from application to application, platform to platform and semantically can change and people may in fact modify the information and add value to that data but not share it. One client I'm working with right now is in a hell called Spreadmart Hell. Has anyone ever heard of that, what that looks like? Tens of thousands of spreadsheets. Some of that is mission critical production data. Right, so c can you imagine trying to unravel, it's like a haystack, yeah? We've got to pull it out straw by straw by straw. So we're actually building tools to analyse and automate the analysis of where the mission critical data is, where the duplicated data is, and start unstacking that environment. Uh, is the data trusted? Is it secure? I put security in there as well. We need to, to know, have we got credit cards? Are we PCI DSS compliant? Is the data in, in fact accurate? Can I trust it when I start using it for processing and such? Movement, again, uncontrolled data movement. Is this occurring? Data duplicates, we don't know what the formats are. Data transitions from one format to another, we have no idea why. Then we have to retransform it back again, waste of energy, resource and money. Um, BI platforms, ultimately we see failure here and breakage in delivering the value and so this is the land of discontent. Remember I used those words? We're not having BI ecstasy anymore. We're, we're having a, a whole lot of discouraged people literally fighting for themselves to try and perform their work. So the BI platform can't consume the data fast enough. Upstream data breakages break the BI environment regularly. So we've got a, a brittle design in terms of data supply. Uh, users don't trust the BI data. Data is semantically changed without explanation. At that point, your users abandon that stack. They'll go and look after themselves, thank you very much. So often they lose faith in IT departments. Is the data reliable? Yes or no. What are the platforms like? Are they resilient? And we've got no understanding of what any of this costs. We've got no framework. We've got no maturity model. We've got no language of pulling engineers together and solving these problems these problems. So again, it's crucial get everyone on the same, same page. Um, this is very normal data culture, dirty data. This is what these risks, unmitigated, produce. Poor quality data, high risks. Um, I was working one, with one client in a regulated environment and every account opened by a person under the age of 16 is a $5,000 fine per incident. So the question came up, well, how many incidents of these do we have? It was up around $50,000. So you do the maths, that's, that's, a, that's a big data quality hit. Do you think the business wanted to solve that? Absolutely, right? Did you think IT kind of cared? It's just a date field, just a date of birth field. What's the problem? Semantically, there was a big risk issue to the business. Um, FTE rework. 
customer churn. This is um, the, the rework factor. I'm open sourcing a framework and a method that helps people calculate this. The data quality environment um, in the marketplace is very technology driven around profiling and mapping and such, right? But there's very few experts and very few people who are going to the next step to understand how do I cost an entire data quality framework to get it up and running and get the funding in place? But how do I actually sustain it because data quality over time, um, excuse me, data quality, data atrophies over time so the quality framework must exist perpetually. So if you've got data today, guess what? You need to have a data quality framework installed, up, running, working and you'll never be without it. So it's like putting locks on your doors. In a BAU state, you go, oh, we've solved the security problem, take the locks off. You don't do that. Same with DQ. You put frameworks in and methods and tools to groom the data and make sure it's accurate and you have to leave it in and let it run in a BAU state. Um, rework, I've calculated rework at a major top 20 global bank out of 280 employees, a big trading bank, big capital markets bank. 23% of staff, full time, this is non-IT staff, monkey with data, which is not their primary job. <coughs> Do you know what that means? One in five staff are drowning in data issues. We found entire teams, instead of doing a business function, they just manipulate data, re-extract, re-reconcile and rework the data. Uh, spread marks, I mentioned uh, about, about that. Business disengagement, this is the formula for disengagement and BI failure. All these risks unmitigated, you know, with a very unhappy and disengaged uh, user base. Regulatory fines, I mentioned, and, and reputational risks as well. Um, where I want to go with this is really from a, a perspective of what we want to supply within the BI world is data as a utility. Now I've heard it described as data tone. So if I pick up the telephone, I want dial tone, right? My dial tone, my telephony is a utility. Similarly, if I've, if I've got an ethernet connector and I want to get into the corporate data, I connect. I want data to pour out that I can trust and I can use right away, yeah? So what happens here is all of these underpinnings that I've described are typically built by IT architects, data architects, solution architects, enterprise planning and strategy folks to build your disciplines which include master data management and the quality framework. You then build and deliver a quality framework that you can measure. But you know what? If you think of the iceberg, this is still under the waterline because the users again just want to capitalise on the data, use the data. So above my hand, that top red dotted line is the users want an operational and strategic view that they can trust. And right here is their current view of the business being pumped out of that BI vertical. That's where they live, that's where they want to be. Suddenly if they can't trust the data, guess what? together with the business and IT, we have to go on a journey backwards, back into this world and say, what's wrong? Why is the data broken? It's arriving late, it's got errors in it, it's causing us all sorts of grief, risks, rework and additional expense. Um, if anyone's seen, you know, Maslow's hierarchy, I'm not quite into that, but I, you know, it was, it was an interesting um, novelty in, in, in looking at this. So, your bottom line down here, just think of your bottom line of Maslow's hierarchy because ultimately you're trying to pour value higher up the value chain from this line upwards to understand your current state and of course get into the whole predictability, the predictability piece. So um, let's move into master, master data. Some of you may have heard different terms and I'm just going to anchor some of those terms into the same topic. Database of record or DBOR, some of you might have, if you're old enough like me, you might have heard that phrase, uh, source of truth or golden record. So if I need to know information about a customer, I need to be able to go somewhere, pull that information out and I can see 
everything I can possibly about the customer and trust that information. So organisationally, that's the record that can travel around, be used and anchored upon. Yeah. Trusted um, MDM is, I need to identify that customer as a unique customer. I need to know the source location, like which system did that customer record come out of. That's really important. Uh, I need to govern that information. Who, who thinks we can just randomly go in and change the structure of the data that we hold on a customer? That can happen and it can actually destroy a whole lot of integration and fidelity unwittingly. So that really needs some, some governance and some process integrity. So it's not without process as well being wrapped around the customer MDM solution. Some of your MDM categories become business dependent. So I'm talking about customer, that's a really obvious one. What about HR, staff, 360 degree view of a person, yeah, an employee, uh, an account, a transaction, a bill. Uh, we can also go down to some of those assets. Remember I talked about water assets, pump stations, electricity power generation plants, mobile equipment, graders, trucks, etc. And then finally, there's a whole realm of reference data and reference data codes. So often master data and reference data get unilater unilaterally spoken of together. So reference codes could be you know, um, state codes, they could be calendars, they can be clocks, um, national codes and the like. They need to be managed and maintained. Some of those can be industry universal and some, some can be peculiar to the business as well. And so when we get to the end of the food chain, if we just take one of these examples in customer, why is it really important? We want to create a new unique customer and onboard them. We need to know how, what data is being captured in the life cycle. How do you, who's who? Which customers which? Uh, how do I relate and communicate with them in re regards to communication? How do I link that back to that record? What have I, what have I said or committed to that customer? Uh, how do I transact with them? How do I ship? products and such, how do I support and how do I know which products they're buying or currently owning and that's non-exhaustive, you just keep on going. So you ask the business what do you want to know about customer and they just come out with a, 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 a litany of things they want to hold and store and master around customer and that's just one subject area. Um, now I didn't want this to be technical but we need to understand what MDM looks like and different vendors have different animals to sell us, right? And, they're and they're architecturally, some of them are slightly different. I'm just going to step through four common patterns, and I, th I think you'll get these. They're pretty straightforward. So the first pattern, top left, is federated. So here we have a virtualized view, and again, I'll just use customer because it's easier to, to sort of comprehend. So I've got addresses sitting in one system, phone and mobile phone, contact in another. I happen to have another system, somewhere else got email. I might have Salesforce up in the cloud with a whole lot of communication. And I might have some demographic information that's really useful to link it all together to s around you know, gender, age groups, socioeconomic so and such, so psychographic, demographic information. So this is a really great, quick, fast way to pull it all together. It's contingent on all the primary and foreign keys aligning. So in a well-engineered environment, that's great, it's quick, and it's relatively easy. Oftentimes that's read-only, it's not that great you know, if you want to be able to update back. The next flavour, top right, is registry. So what's registry mean? All I'm doing in this green box, I'm just capturing primary and foreign keys and I'm linking them together, the relationships of all the underlying systems. I've got the key to go in and get the email, but I'm not storing the email in the registry. So that's, that's the registry style. MDM moves on to repository. This is where I physically create an instantiated database in, the, in this bottom left called a master database, yeah? And usually in these repository styles, I'm mastering, synchronizing, and cleansing. So there's a variety of processes. It becomes almost like a mini application in and of itself. So again, I can link to all these other sources, but I'm actually pushing and pulling data through and my source of truth is sitting for customers sitting in that engine, right? And then finally out on the bottom right hand side is a hybrid or it's a mix of, of, of some of those as well. Now for, for those of you who are into the information engineering side, 
these don't come for free. So you can install them, but we still have to model them. And, and in this case, if we're dealing with custom, we've got a model customer from an enterprise view. And in every single case, you'll have the modeled view, the complete modeled view of a customer. Now that sounds kind of cool. Operationally, it's kind of cool. But it also gives us a trade-up when we're transitioning data, true customer data, out to the warehouse or your BI environment. So instead of doing a whole lot of transformation, that in essence should have been done in the implementation of MDM in the first place. So we literally should be able to extract from any of those green boxes very, very quickly out into our BI world. So I'm just going to give you some, uh, a couple of architectural examples. These are kind of what-if scenarios in the different styles. So just going from the top, we don't have to use an MDM world at all. We'll just go and attack the raw sources, bring them into our operational data store, do some modelling, transformation and conformance, and then load it into the warehouse at the end. Okay, that's one design pattern. Another one, get, then going through the M MDM styles, You'll notice that I've added, there's a subject model. So this is the customer modeling has already been done to physically build these objects. We don't really need to do too much more. However, if I'm coming from an asset MDM or a product, what they call a product information management tool, a PIM tool, where all my product is mastered, so I'm coming through one of these lanes, before it goes into the warehouse, I may need to remodel from an enterprise view to bind these things together. So we're talking about layers and layers of modeling. So in terms of speed, if you've got a customer MDM or a product MDM or an asset MDM, normally modeling is already done. There is a sense of truth in that source. We can pull it through into the warehouse, uh, which is great. Um, this is just a big picture, just trying to pull it all together. Now I'm exaggerating a little because uh, what you've done is you've gone out and deployed MDM solutions for all your major data subject areas. So we've got a customer MDM here on the, on the top. Uh, we have some, still some residual raw data sources that we haven't, we're thinking they're all mastered in those containers, that's fine. I've got a product information management MDM. Here I might have an asset, and here, here's something else. Could be staff, HR, could, could be anything else. So again, same thing. Those should be modelled in conformance. We can pull them straight through, mirror them, and then bring them into the warehouse. This, this modelling is really the enterprise view, because everything's being smashed together at the enterprise realm. Okay, so I just wanted to play out that awareness. Now the good thing is, in architectures like these, we can put yellow fin on top of pretty much any layer. So yes, it can run off the warehouse. Yes, yellow fin can run off the real-time operational data stores. Fantastic. Um, you'll find yellow fin more than capable of, of injecting itself straight over the top of any discrete MDM solution. And then similarly, if you're going out to raw, um, raw data and raw data systems. So this is a really cool way of building out MDM, testing your, testing your views along the way and ultimately satisfying the mastery or the truthfulness of, say, your customer data, and then also being able to accelerate the pulling of that information into your enterprise warehouse or your BI solution. Um, I'm going to move into data quality now. So we've, we've, we've dealt a little bit with master data management. I'm just going to touch on data quality. Uh, here's some terms that you might see out on the left. Data quality frameworks, governance, data quality tools. There might be dimensions of data quality you've heard of, like timeliness, completeness, accuracy, metrics, and, and activities like profiling. So that's all very common in the data quality world. Some of the challenges around uh, data quality are lack of clear ownership and accountability. Some of the data uh, Definitions are very ambiguous. Um, the same data object can be called by several different business names. The business can take an object, call it one thing, when physically it could be three or four different things. So we're getting into the realm of semantics, big, big issue which no doubt many of you have uh, run into. Data, data duplicates, the, the trust issue of uh, source of truth and MDM. 
and often the data gets moved and as it's moving and transformed it's poorly understood in the way that it changes as it's travelling through the pipes of, of your system. So basically what that does, it runs the risk not always that, but more likely your BI and warehouse becomes a dumping ground of dirty data. Right? You're right at the end of the food chain and you don't want to be really. So that's why you've got to push back and understand some of these other core building blocks and defend your design so that at least you're getting some filtered data and some clean data into your world. Yeah. So the critical business usage ultimately to feed all these lines of business is they want confidence in the data. They can make decisions and operate on clean information. They really want data as a utility. They don't care. The business doesn't care about really any of these boxes that I'm sharing with you at the bottom. They don't. They put them to sleep. You guys are smart. You're in the data world. You're intelligent. You're getting what I'm saying. But the reality is if, if we're full of business people, they'll be snoring, right? They, they don't really care. They just want to attack that box and pump the data out and use it, yeah? Uh, accessibility to the data. Can I get the data? Often the users have difficulty doing that for different reasons, for security policies, IT behaviour and culture and such. Even lack of tooling, even tooling. Uh, so this is where Yellowfin can help infinitely in, in that endeavour. And then can they trust the data? Is the quality there? So when I'm looking at the data, can I actually use it? Um, I've got a few examples there. Um, I've got some of those from IQ uh, Trainwreck. I mentioned uh, another one around the $5,000 per record uh, regulatory fines, um, uh, migrating information from a pharmaceutical, a legacy environment, 8,000 units, which was 8,000 grams became 8,000 kilograms. Suddenly someone's got a semi-trailer loaded with highly valuable minerals at some extraordinary cost that's actually an error based on the metric of what they were supposed to be ordering. So we all know, we've heard different data quality uh, train wreck uh, issues uh, emerge from time to time. Um, moving along, data quality as I said earlier, it's an issue today and it's an, it's an albatross, it's never going to go away. So we have to lean into it and solve it. We've got to solve it in a way where it becomes fundable, executable and survivable. Yeah? Um, going back to about 2003, data and the data space there was the three V's, you've all heard of that, volume, variety and velocity. Today there's a couple more. Volatility, things change. So this is the event-driven Internet of Things world. Value, not all, not all data is the same value. The business doesn't quite care about certain data elements. It cares about the KPIs it uses to instrument the business and make decisions and drive the business. And finally, veracity, that's the, the truthfulness of the information, the whole quality, the quality realm. Part of the framework that uh, I put together for costing, um, there's different industry groups that really go overboard on this data quality stuff. They get really scientific and again they can disengage the business. This is a whole business view or business approach to data quality. Get them to own their data, get them to understand the quality, get them to fund and drive their own data quality remediation program. And that's where success is. I've seen so many data quality, data governance initiatives get enthusiastic and excited, but the half-life is three to six months. Okay, the funding disappears, the business disengages, and it's all over, yeah? So um, the idea is to work out timeliness, accuracy. If I've got a problem, can I get some support? Can I access the data? And what's the confidence of the data when I get a hold of it? And I can go from team to team to team to team, and individual to individual, and rate the rework and come up with a financial dollar figure to actually rate the damage in data quality terms. This is an energy retail example of uh, 500 personnel got interviewed, went through the framework. You can see over here there's 13%, it's the equivalent of 65 staff, completely wasted. They have nothing to do with IT, nothing to do with data, but guess what they do? Every day of their working life is grooming and manipulating data that they shouldn't be, yeah? So this was very enlightening for that particular organisation. And then similarly over on in the uh, banking realm, banking and insurance, m much more data intensive business, so the likelihood if, it, if those foundations are poor, 
the damage is even greater. Okay, does that, does that make sense? Um, putting these frameworks together, I have the other presentation I have. It goes into a lot more granular detail. It's it's purely data quality. So if you're really into data quality, I'd recommend you grab that presentation from last year. But in essence, you know, you've got technical teams looking after technology tools on the left, technical metrics and technical drivers. What they're missing and they don't understand typically is the business metrics and the business drivers on that right hand side. So when we solve correctly for data governance and quality, moving it all up, you'll see that the business users, they, they really want to understand customer churn. They want to be in that, remember the Maslow's hierarchy, they want to operate out of that top blue box, data is a utility, just tell me why I'm losing customers, where are we losing customers to? They don't want to think about data breakage, that is, heck, I've got a report and I can't even trust the data, so then they've got to go down Maslow's hierarchy into the IT department and try and cl cleanse and fix the data to make a decision. So the issues in, in these two orange boxes are the business metrics and the business drivers. These are risks. These are capital costs. This is rework, wastage, FTE duplication, and a range of other issues that can be monetized. Yeah? So you see the business users on the right, that's their thing. Technical users on the left, they can do the profiling. Right? They can do the inspection and the, and the mechanical cleansing for, for the users. Uh, last couple of charts and um, we'll, I'll take some questions. Um, invariably, when you've got data quality issues, they're bubbling up all over the organisation, but generally there's no one place where data quality issues are corralled, so you can actually see them in the one place and try and treat them the same or at least cost them and see what the damage is like. So this is just a chart just talking about a particular use case scenario, an example we ran into, you know, a thousand of issues a day bubbling up, but they were coming in through uh, a service deck. So there's project issue logs, risk registers, and other business quality systems. So data quality issues can be bubbling away from BI, a long way away from your project, but we need to get at them and understand what we're dealing with before we start pouring them all backwards into our BI world into our beautiful visualization tool, we've got all this rubbish data. Yeah. Um, I think uh, this is the um, the second last slide, and I've got a, a conclusion chart which uh, which I'll just quickly step through. But in terms of um, overall data governance and and dealing with data quality, you really need some kind of framework that pulls all those items that I shared with you, the foundationalized items together. The second piece is you need a specific method when you're treating and dealing with DQ issues. And that's really quite sophisticated and complex. I've actually gone through um, Six Sigma and we've got a stripped down version of Six Sigma that's light and easy to use, easy to understand there. Then we need some tools and the irony of ironies is to actually get visibility on the DQ issues. There's no better tool to look at than Yellowfin to actually look into the DQ issues, and that's something else that we're building, which is fantastic. Um, so we've got the DQ issues management under Six Sigma. We can define our models. We can capture the data quality rules. We can pull in the profiling from any platform, Oracle, SAP, whatever, and, uh, and keep the data clean so that by the time you're consuming it in your BI world, you're delighting people because they've got a great visual experience and they can trust the information they're looking at. So in conclusion, this is really just a, a, a bullet list of things that we've talked about. Aim for data as a utility. That's a really sw smart way to go because you're trying to take all the moving parts away from the users. Some of the new data challenges, not all data is equal. The veracity or the truthfulness of data is, is really uh, uh, incredibly important. Um, something in the other presentation I really emphasise with um, people like Bank of America, the data world's moving into real time. I think you heard that from John's presentation earlier from Actian. So, you know, m moving to real time BI is going to be a necessity. I think we all need to become good practitioners and understanding of, of what it takes to build that out. Um, specific MDM solutions, I've given you an idea of some styles and how sophisticated that could, your MDM footprint could become 
and how it relates to your BI environment. Data quality in BI can coexist. The, the warning is if you're running a BI environment, you don't really want to own data quality. Data quality is an enterprise issue and it really should sit in the business as well. So it's got to go up and, and out to the business. Uh, data quality is a continuum. Uh, get your foundations in order. I've mentioned some of those. I've got more training material on that stuff. If you get stuck on any of those pillars, happy to help you on, on those. But it's, an, it's a full ecosystem that works harmoniously together to get your data right. Um, yeah, so I think, uh, I think on that I'm, I'm going to draw it all close and I'm happy to take any questions at all if anyone's game. Thanks. Uh, is this for examining data quality? No, no. So, so here, here's an interest. This is an interesting dilemma. If I'm a user and I'm looking at a production system and I'm looking at some data and the data is wrong, some users have an expectation that they should see that error faithfully reproduced in the BI world, so they can see it. And oftentimes, transforms make an effort to clean the data up so that. The user goes over and says, I'm looking for that shipment that's got the error in it, it's got a missing line item or, or whatever. I can't see it in the BI world. So they start to get suspicious and mistrusting your BI target world. So really, your data quality, even if you, uh, we heard from that gentleman at uh, the previous session. Yeah, uh, what was the name of his? He's OEMing Yellowfin. Bevan. So if anyone took, heard from Bevan, they migrate data from legacy systems into their environment. They have the same rubbish legacy data quality issues. They've got to groom and cleanse and prepare the data to bring it into the new, shiny new target system. So you can run DQ, but you really need to run it on your operational systems. A lot of organisations don't. They believe BI is going to fix it. And trust me, that, that is, that's the road to hell, right? It's the road to hell. Oh, that was a great question. Come on, a couple, couple more before we wrap up. Anybody? Yeah, um, I was, I've worked on a data quality project that ultimately failed because um, they couldn't put a value on uh, what, what the benefit was. There you go. Their customer's address, for example. There you go. So all of it intangible. There you go. Have you got any approaches for? Yep, that's, um, so I'm going to give you an advertisement. I'm building a product in, in parallel with, um, in tandem with Yellowfin. So I've got an application, a framework and method and a reporting tool which is obviously Yellowfin. But the secret source is the ability to commercialise data quality. I've got a whole framework, I've done it before several times, different industries and I can show you how to do it. And I'm open sourcing that knowledge so I can actually give it to everyone for free. So it'll be freely downloadable at ClearDQ, which is Clear, my brand, DQ for data quality. So watch that space. It's all happening as we speak in the next two months. It'll all be finished and up there. So that people can then go and build out their own tools. We built a tool in SharePoint. Wasn't that great, but it was out of necessity. But I've got better ways of building tools and putting Yellowfin on top. Right? So you can actually build your own tool once you know how the method and the framework actually works. You, you can do it on paper, you can do it on Excel. Right, it's, it's that simple, yeah? That's a great question. Thanks everybody. Thank you.